Hello. Okay, this is the Battle of Carantan. Uh, Normandy, 1944. This is animated, but if you've seen Band of Brothers, then you'll kind of know this battle. I love Band of Brothers. Watch it every year. So I'm going to watch this right now, and since you're watching the video, you're going to watch it too. Let's enjoy. Hey, guess what? Today we're sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Oh, that's awesome. If Rear Admiral Wright had been a mobile gamer, this epic free-to-play RPG would definitely be his favourite. Cool deal. How do you like them onions? Uh, it's June great. 7th, 1944, D plus one, and Supreme Allied Commander General Dwight Eisenhower has come ashore at Omaha Beach to personally assess the situation in Normandy. In a meeting with US First Army Commander Lieutenant General Omar Brad- My grandpa was in Omaha. I think day two? Something like that? Lee. Eisenhower turns his attention to the small town of Carantan at the base of the Cottontan Peninsula. Although American forces are advancing out of their beachheads, pockets of strong German resistance aided by Normandy's thick hedgerows and the general disarray of the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions causes progress to be slower than originally planned. Consequently, Eisenhower becomes concerned German forces could take advantage of the unsecured ground between Utah and Omaha beaches leading General Bradley to order 7 Corps Commander Major General Collins to eliminate this possibility and connect the two US beaches together by taking Carantan. Both sides are beginning to recognise the importance of Carantan, and to ensure the town does not fall to American forces, Field Marshal Rommel orders the fresh and untested 17th SS Panzer Grenadier Division to the area. Simultaneously, General Collins assigns the 101st Airborne Division, currently holding the front line south of Utah Beach, the vital mission of taking and holding Carantan, thereby connecting the American beachheads. But before the 101st can assault Carantan, they will have to fight to get to the town itself. Commanding the assaulting forces, Brigadier Anthony McAuliffe directs his paratroopers to first seize San Con du Mont and open the road to Carantan. Standing in their way are two battalions of Colonel von der Heitz's 6th Fallschirmjäger Regiment, and in Sam Condemont itself are the remnants of an assault infantry battalion. In the early morning of June 8th, following a preparatory artillery bombardment, the 1st and 2nd battalions of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, the 3rd battalion of the 501st, and the 1st battalion of the 401st Glider Infantry Regiment, launch an attack towards Sam Condemont from three sides. They force the remnants of the assault infantry battalion to fall back to the west of the village before subsequently turning down the road towards Carantan. The 3rd battalion of the 506th, which has passed through Le Drury, pushes to the Carantan highway. Upon reaching the highway, they take heavy small arms and anti-tank gun fire from German positions near the first of four bridges and even 88mm fire from Carantan itself. As a result, 3rd battalion retreat to the east of the highway but in doing so, come under attack from the north from retreating German units coming down the highway. German forces attack 3rd Battalion five times over the course of the day, and though every attack reaches very close to 3rd Battalion's position, the attacks fail to break through, and by the close of June the 8th, the 101st hold the northern side of the causeway that leads into Carantan. Due to the flooded and marshy terrain on both sides of the causeway, the paratroopers will have little choice but to funnel their upcoming attack down the exposed causeway itself, and it falls to the 3rd Battalion 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment to secure it. At just after midnight on June the 10th, as 3rd Battalion are about to launch their assault, they find the second of the four bridges over the causeway, which the retreating Germans blew up two days earlier, has yet to be completely repaired as the engineers repairing it have been receiving heavy German fire. Nevertheless, one scout patrol continues down to the fourth bridge, which they discover is being obstructed by a large Belgium anti-tank gate. They squeeze through it one at a time, 
but having done so, advanced just 50 metres before coming under withering fire from German positions on the high ground to the southwest. They retreat. The following morning, American artillery pounds German positions southwest of the fourth bridge, but by midday, the second bridge has still not been completely repaired. Not willing to wait any longer, some paratroopers led by Lieutenant Colonel Cole fashion a makeshift bridge and the battalion moves over the canal one by one. However, once over the canal, their progress is slowed by 88mm fire from Carantan itself, and as the paratroopers get to the third bridge, they come under intense machine gun fire from German positions on their right. American artillery responds, firing well into the evening in an attempt to suppress the German fire. One company is able to set up a mortar position near the final bridge, but the company that follows is subjected to intense small arms fire and even a rare strafing run by two German Stukas not long before midnight. Having taken very heavy losses, the company is forced to pull back to the second bridge. Despite this, with midnight approaching, the German fire begins to subside and H Company is finally able to cross the fourth bridge. At sunrise the following day, Around 250 paratroopers of 3rd Battalion have made it to the 4th bridge, but they are still taking heavy fire from German positions in the direction of a large farm that dominates the ground between them. As a result, Lt. Col. Cole, along with the Battalion Executive Officer Major John Stopker, decide to launch a bayonet charge towards the farm. Under the cover of smoke from American artillery, at 6.15am they assault the farm with 70 men. Like their fathers before them, the young men sprint across the French field, bayonets fixed. Fortunately, unlike their fathers before them, they find the barn abandoned. 1st Battalion moves up to support Cole's men at the farm. German infantry launch a furious counter-attack against the farm. They come very close to pushing the paratroopers back, but with the intervention of American artillery fire right up to their position, the German attack is repelled. After days of furious fighting, the 6th Fallschirmjäger Regiment is exhausted and running very short on ammunition. They receive resupply from the air, but the supplies are dropped 9 miles behind the front line. The high US casualties suffered on the causeway earns it the nickname Purple Heart Lane. Whilst the furious fighting for the causeway has been taking place, the 327th Glider Infantry Regiment moves across the Douve River to the east. After securing the roads east of Carantan by the close of June the 10th, the 327th holds the ground near the eastern suburbs. Due to the good progress the 327th has made in comparison to the hard fighting taking place over on the causeway, McAuliffe directs the 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment to join the 327th and prepare to assault Carantan itself. McAuliffe plans for the 327th to advance straight into Carantan from the northeast whilst the 501st and 506th attack from the southwest, cutting off any avenue of escape for German forces in the town. Realising the danger, German commander von der Heiter decides his forces will be destroyed unless he pulls out of Carantan. Late on the 11th, his men begin to withdraw southwest. He leaves one depleted company in the town to delay the American attack. Uh, so the company that's left behind, what is the objective there? Is it a suicide mission for them? Or are they just trying to hold out, I know to help um, the 6th unit get away, but are they to hold the town until they're no longer breathing? Or are they told you know, try to escape? Um, you're gonna have to surrender like like what's the objective to leave those guys behind because I would figure it's a suicide mission but it could be wrong as dawn turns to morning on June 12th the men of Easy Company 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment wait anxiously after marching throughout the night to get into position for the assault Easy Company's objective is a T-junction on the edge of the town at 6 a.m. They launch their assault. First platoon, led by Lieutenant Welsh, are to assault down the road into the town, but as they begin to move forward a German machine gun opens fire on them, catching them in the open. Most of Welsh's platoon dive into the ditches on either side of the road and they try to get as low as possible to avoid the German machine gun fire. 
Welsh himself continues into the machine gun fire, with six other men. Seeing this, Lieutenant Winters, commander of Easy Company, brazenly charges out into the road under fire and yells at his men to move forward. First platoon remain pinned to the ground. In a rage, and with bullets landing all around him, Lieutenant Winters was in uh, Band of Brothers if you don't know. Winters starts physically kicking his men, desperately trying to get them to move forward and help his friend Lieutenant Welsh in neutralising the German machine gun. Seeing how uncharacteristically animated Winters has become, Easy Company's men begin to move forward. While Winters is frantically trying to coax his men to attack, he provides enough of a distraction to allow Welsh and the six men with him to attack the German machine gun with grenades. With the machine gun neutralised, Easy Company moves fast to secure the intersection and begins the process of sweeping the streets with small arms fire and clearing the buildings with grenades in an effort to root out any last German resistance. The German troops respond with mortar fire, and the paratroopers are forced to find cover. Nevertheless, at 7am Easy Company finally links up with the rest of the paratroopers pushing down into the town from the north. The strategic town of Carantan is now in American hands. However, due to the importance of the town, American commanders are sure the Germans will try to retake it with a counter-attack. In the afternoon of the 12th of June, the 501st and 506th Parachute Infantry Regiments are ordered to secure the southwestern route into the town. As they move into their new positions at midday, 2nd Battalion of the 506th comes under fire from a small enemy force. The Americans force the German patrol back to Deauville. Waiting for them there is a strong concentration of the newly arrived SS Panzer Grenadiers, and the 506th is in turn pushed back again. By the end of the day, the 501st and 506th are holding positions not far from Hill 30. The next day, June the 13th, the 506th are ordered to attack once again and increase the defensive barrier surrounding Carantan, but they are not the only ones planning an attack. German High Command has been following the situation closely, and upon learning Carantan has fallen, the Führer himself orders the town to be recaptured. With the 17th SS Panzergrenadier Division now arrived in the area, the division's commander, Werner Ostendorf, is determined to retake Carantan with an attack from the west. The SS Panzergrenadier Regiment 37, what remains of the 6th Fallschirmjäger Regiment, and SS Panzer Abteilung 17 prepare for the assault with 48 Stug 4 assault guns leading the attack. Ostendorf is confident that an attack led by so many armoured fighting vehicles will overwhelm the American defences and allow his division to retake Carantan. However, the codebreakers at Bletchley Park intercept and decrypt German Enigma communications planning the assault by the SS Panzer Grenadiers. In response, General Bradley decides that the 2nd Armoured Division, just landed in Normandy, should promptly send reinforcements to support the paratroopers defending Carantan. At 7am, June the 13th, as the 506th are preparing to begin their own assault, German forces launch their counter-attack. The entire battlefield erupts in a storm of rifle, machine gun, mortar and artillery fire, as each side does all they can to smother the other with overwhelming firepower. Easy Company is positioned on the 2nd Battalion 506th right flank of the line, with Fox Company in the middle, and Dog Company on their left flank. With the intensity of German fire, and spotting the German Stug 4s in the enemy line, Fox Company pulls back, thereby exposing Dog Company's right flank, and in turn causing it to pull back also. Easy Company is now alone, and they do all they can to keep up their fire and hold their ground as their officers in turn do all they can to encourage their men to hold the line. As a Stug 4 begins to crash through the hedgerow in front of F Company's former position, Lieutenant Welsh and Private McGrath rush out into the open with a bazooka to confront the menacing German armoured assault vehicle. Their first rocket deflects off the front of the Stug, and as they begin to reload it fires a 75mm round, just missing Welsh and McGrath. As the Stug climbs over the hedgerow, it exposes its thin armour on the underbelly of the vehicle. Welsh and McGrath, having reloaded their bazooka, hit the Stug in its underbelly causing an internal explosion. Seeing this, other German Stugs following behind begin to back away as Welsh and McGrath return to their original position. Dog and Fox companies regroup and return to the battle not far from their original positions, 
and along with Easy Company continued to exchange heavy fire with the Germans in the opposite hedgerow. Along the line from Easy Company's stand, the German counterattack pushes to just 500 yards from Carentan, and the front line is on the verge of collapsing. But in the constricted terrain of the hedgerows, the 506th is able to slow the German attack as the untested Panzer Grenadiers struggle to coordinate their attack in the maze of the Normandy Bocage. They even find themselves coming under attack on their flanks from paratroopers who have worked their way around the German attack. A number of Stug 4s are destroyed by American 57mm anti-tank guns and bazookas. Nevertheless, drained from a week of constant combat, the 101st Airborne Division defending Carentan desperately needs support and reinforcement against the onslaught. At 2pm, after a day of standing up to the merciless assault, tanks of the 2nd Armoured Division arrive and counterattack. The M4 Shermans roll forward, smothering the German attackers with 75mm gunfire and their 50 and 30 calibre machine guns. Infantry reinforcements of the 29th Infantry Division move up with the Shermans. The American armour destroys 7 Stug 4s, with another 13 damaged. Facing now overwhelming firepower and heavy armour, the Germans are forced to retreat. Despite the supreme confidence of their commander, their attack has been halted and decisively turned back. By capturing Carentan, the 101st Airborne Division secures a major strategic objective for the Allies in Normandy, allowing the breakouts at Utah and Omaha beaches to connect into one continuous beachhead. This deals a major blow to German forces, desperately attempting to stem the Allied advance. When the 101st is pulled off the line on July 8, 1944, it has lost 868 killed, 2,303 wounded, and 665 missing, a casualty rate of 50%. However, there can be little doubt that the brave men of the 101st Airborne Division have played a crucial role in securing the Allied foothold in Normandy and securing the way for the long road into the heart of Germany. Wow. Uh, That's pretty good. If you haven't um, seen Band of Brothers, it's a ten-part, uh, hour-long per episode, done by Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks. Um, great cast. It's, it's a great series. All right, well, I'm going to end this here. That's really good. Uh, until next time, have a good day, have a good night.